Hello everyone, this is John Buck, back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. This video continues our discussion of time-dependent Fourier transforms. In particular, in this video, I'm going to show you an example of using MATLAB's spectrogram command to make a plot of the magnitude of the time-dependent time Fourier transform for the signals I played for you earlier in the first video. So if you haven't already watched the video on the basics about time-dependent Fourier transforms, I, I recommend you look at that one first and then come back to this one to see how we're going to actually make figures in MATLAB to, to understand the difference in time frequency content of the two sounds I played for you in that one. Just to refresh your memory, let me get the sounds up again and play them for you. The first sound is, is a steady version of two tones. And the second sound is the same two frequencies, but alternating between the two tones. So again, a, an example where the two signals contain the same frequencies, but how they present them in time changes, and we'd like to find a representation that is clear, makes it clear to see what's going on with them. So the key to doing this is the MATLAB spectrogram command, which I've outlined right here. Let me talk you through the arguments, and I'll show you how to use it. The first input argument, x, is just the signal, the discrete time signal that's been sampled or often loaded from a data file. The second argument is a vector that is a window. We often want to uh, apply a window, like a handing or hamming window, like we did in FIR filter design, which, as you remember, pushes the side lobes down. So it will reduce side lobes we get overlapping or hiding other weak components of the signal. But you can just use a rectangular window here as well. So this is a vector. This window is a vector. We'll often use it for a hamming. In the or the example I'll show you today, this will be maybe a hamming window or maybe rectangular. The next, sig next argument is the number of samples to overlap. It's how, much, how many samples do the blocks overlap by as I go from one block to the next. Something important I should have mentioned about window is that window, window is a vector. The length of window implicitly tells us what the length of the block size will be. So it's what, what size the blocks will be. If window is just an uh, integer, that divides x into that many segments. So if it's an integer, it tells me how many windows I want for x. And the MATLAB will automatically figure out how long they should be and apply a Hamming window to each one, which is the default window. OK, so then n overlap tells me how much those windows should overlap by as I go across the signal. In the example I showed you on the previous page, I used half overlap. So the overlap in this example would be n over 2. But more generally, it's how many samples do the windows overlap. And in the examples I'll show you today, that number will be n over 2. The next argument, nfft, will tell me the fft size to use to compute the Fourier transform of each block to avoid time domain aliasing or other distortions. We want nfft to be at least as big as the window length. It can be bigger if you want a finer sampling of the frequency axis. So it should be at least as big as the length of the window. And then the last argument, which is optional, you don't have to give it, it will be assumed to be 1 if you don't, but this is the sampling frequency. If you give this, the axes will be labeled in terms of hertz. All right, so this is sampling frequency, which is 1 by t. OK, so those are the basic arguments on the input. On the output side, this will by default be the magnitude. It will be a matrix. That's the magnitude of the time varying x of e to the j omega. But by default, it will only be for the positive frequencies when x is a real valued signal, because we know the other side is just symmetric. And you don't usually want to take up display space showing things you know what they are by symmetry. The f, this is the, the, the frequency points for the, the vertical uh, rows of this. So this is basically the frequency axis uh, labels that we're going to be plotting against. And the t vector, the third one, is the time labels. So that will let us label the horizontal axis in seconds, again, if we give f of s. This f and t are not usually valuable without knowing what the sampling frequency is, because we can't, if we don't know f s, we can't convert the dimensions of x back to the original time domain, continuous time frequencies. So that's an outline of the arguments. Let me show you how this works. Let me pull up my editor window. So here's my, my example where I've read in the two wave files that I played for you at the start using the audio read command. For the first one, xsteady, I've 
I've used I've taken both the, the vector x that's the samples of the signal and fs is the sampling frequency from the wave file. For the second one I just took the samples because I know since I made them they're at the same sampling frequency. More generally you might want each one to be at the same sampling frequency. I also know they can use a common time axis. I made them exactly the same length. So I'm being a little lazy here. In practice you probably want to, to download FS to be safe. Have FS and T defined for time axis defined for each signal. Right? But it's going to be the length of the signal and then I scale it by each sample is 1 over FS or capital T apart. I figure out what size FFT I need if I'm going to take the FFT for the whole signal at once. I'm going to do that to show you how uh, things look and how it's there's very little difference between the Fourier transforms if I take the Fourier transform of the whole signal because they basically have the same frequencies in them for the same energy. And then for the spectrograms I'm going to do uh, my, my FFT will be 256 points long for each block. I define my window to be the Hamming window of that length. And I'm going to overlap them by half the block size. And so I then call the spectrogram for the steady state one using my signal, the window I just defined, the overlap, the FFT size, and then the original sampling frequency I got from the wave file. I then have the spectrogram frequency and time axis. I do the same thing for the alternating signal, and the only thing that changes is the output argument and then exalt the, the time samples. I don't need to repeat the F and T arguments because they're going to be the same since all the other parameters were the same for the signal, including the signal length. In general, you probably would define one differently for each signal. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to make some plots here. I'm going to plot uh, just the magnitudes of the Fourier transform. Let me show you what these gave me. When I look at this file, this is again my magnitude and my frequency on the vertical axis. My horizontal axis is the frequency in hertz from zero to half the sampling frequency. And I see pretty clearly they both have nice strong spikes at the same frequencies, which are 500 and 750 hertz. And they look a little different in the fuzzy details here. But from the first glance, it's not obvious that these two signals sound so differently from looking at the magnitude. In fact, it's not clear which is which. I'm going to need to pull up another version where I actually labeled them so you know which is which. But I'm sort of making the point here, they're so similar, it's not obvious which one is the steady tone and which one is alternating. So now let me switch to the version of this window that has labeled the title or put titles on the. So now we can see that the first one with the cleaner spikes is the steady tone. The the mess the one with a little more messy and some side load behavior going on here is the alternating tones. But again, you wouldn't want to read too much into that. You'd have to really be an expert. And I don't know that you would ever just look at this magnitude and be able to say it's alternating tones. The sort of jump between frequency does make a small transient that adds this extra energy. But this really isn't what we're after. We'd like to see something that we can read nice and clear about what's going on and see the difference. It is pretty clear in the time domain. Let me show you the time domain plots and the signals. So what I'm showing you here is actually just a, a section from 0.05 seconds to 0.15 seconds. I had to zoom in so you can see the waveform. Otherwise it just looks like I colored it solid. But you can see here this is a nice steady waveform that's perfectly periodic, perfectly rep repeating. Whereas the bottom graph, but it's not just a sine wave, right? We see the sum of those two sine waves makes for some kind of interference pattern. Whereas in the bottom one, we see I've got a low frequency, and then right here at a tenth of a second, it jumps to a higher frequency because the period gets shorter. So we can clearly see in the time domain there's something changing even if we don't see the frequency. So now let's look at what we see when we run the spectrogram and, and plot those. So here's a spectrogram. As, as we said in the previous video, the x-axis is the time axis in seconds for each plot. And the vertical axis is frequency from 0 to half the sampling frequency. These signals were sampled at 8 kilohertz, so it goes from 0 to 4,000 hertz. And then the dark blue indicates places where there's very low energy. The, the brighter yellow and oranges indicate times and frequencies that have a lot of energy. So the first one looks like what we heard, that we just hear two constant frequencies going the whole way across with equal amplitude. If the amplitude was changing, we'd see the colors go from, from uh, dark, cooler to warmer colors. The bottom one, we see the alternating tones, though. You can see there's generally only one frequency at a time present. There's a little bit, right, I go from low frequency, high frequency, low frequency, high frequency. We can see it jumping back and forth, playing each frequency five times. Because they're the same frequencies, these lines are at the same place, but this picture makes it really clear that one is just 
each Fourier transform is like a slice going up this plot, and they're all the same Fourier transform at each time block because it's the same two frequencies. Where the bottom one, we go from something that's one. Here's a there's a little transition here when the window happens to overlap this change, like I showed you on the previous picture. Let me pull that back for a second. Like if I happen to have a window overlapping like this, it will have some of each frequency present. And so you can see a little bit of that going on in these overlap regions that also creates some interference that runs across the frequency, making these sort of vertical bars in green. But it, mainly paying attention to the loud yellows, the yellow for the loud stuff, with a little bit of orange showing there's some interference where two frequencies are both present in the window as it slides over the transition. Right, but... But now let me let me just finish this off by playing the sounds one more time. Playing the steady sound first. Again, nice consistent tone, no change over time, just like the picture shows. All frequencies are equally powerful at all times. Whereas if I go to the alternating one, you can hear it starts low, goes up, low, up, low, up, low. So it goes from low, high, low, high, low, high frequency. And this picture is a much clearer picture of how the frequencies are evolving over time, hopping back and forth, not moving smoothly like they might in a chirp or other things like that. You can also, now that we've seen the simple example, go to much more complicated signals if you like for things like speech or uh, or music. We can also make spectrograms for those and they'll be very complicated because there will be a lot of frequencies changing and evolving over time. So to finish, we can have a, a very complicated spectrogram like this from a speech signal where we see we're, we're just showing from 0 to 10 kilohertz. There's some low frequency noise in it, but you can also see the different frequencies in the speaker's voice and high frequencies for certain sounds within, within speech. Let me play this for you. Line up at the screen door. So this is the sentence line up at the screen door shown as a spectrogram taking a little more than two seconds from zero to 10 kilohertz on the vertical axis. Again, the brighter colors show where the energy is highest, which is often the low frequencies because the speaker, which was me, has a fairly low voice for that. Okay, so that's all for this time. I'm going to stop here, but you, you see now that the very complicated things like speech, we can see different structures within different syllables in the sound with some practice. You can start to line up some of these these images or elements of these images with different vowel sounds or consonants as well start to, to recognize them as well. Okay, so that's all for this time. I'll see you in class.